Welcome club members, my Kirsty, quite a few familiar faces, Des, Co. Um, I don't think I have to introduce myself, but I will just in case. Um, I'm privileged to be a member of St Kilda Club uh, for about nine years now since moving to Melbourne after spending many years around Australia and around the world. Um, living a journey uh, 21 years later, Grace Brown is now living as a, as a bike rider um, uh, of some note. Um, but I do want to say that when we when we when we think about the um, the wonderful human that we are um, having some spending some time with tonight, here we are in Melbourne uh, in lockdown number six officially. We're in Grace. We're in day three of that three. Yes, day three. Coming up to the end of day three, and it's a little bit like Noah's Ark. We can we can exercise with one other person. Um, we can go five kilometres, and luckily for most of us who are St Kilda Club members and live in the region of St Kilda, we've got some a really nice environment to ride our bikes in. I would say we're pretty privileged. Though those of us who've got Zwift certainly are welcoming Zwift as well to get <coughs> the adrenaline going. Um, Grace um, is joining us and she'll share where she's in a moment. Uh, but one thing, uh, it's great to be part of a wonderful club like St Kilda Cycling Club. And I'm just such a joy for me to be here, part of this club since joining. Um, but importantly, uh, Grace has just joined another club, which is a club forever. And Grace, welcome to the Olympians Club. <laughs> Thank you, be, um, you can be a club member you can be a state club member you can be a national club member you can be a continental champion and a world champion but you are always an olympian once you're an olympian so uh welcome and congratulations and i'm just going to show you you will probably get something like this pretty soon uh, yeah yeah pretty cool <laughs> There's a few things that when you look back, like maybe getting old and slow uh, or slower, um, there are some special things and we'd love to interview in 20 years time and say, okay, what are the things that you look back on? Um, and it's very special to be at this stage um, talking with you and amongst our fellow club members. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, We've got about 45 minutes or so. Um, going to just share for those who are not across the rapid rise uh, of Grace's sporting palmares, in particular cycling, just what you've done in the last three or four years and, and invite some more questions about how you get there so quickly later on. Um, then introduce uh, Grace formally. You can open a few words. We want to know where you are, first instance, what you're doing after the Olympic Games, given it's still happening. The closing ceremony starts in a couple of hours. Um, and then we've got a, a Q&A for about 20 minutes. We've got some, some questions that go through history, um, of course, the Olympic Games, what's on next. And then what we'd love to do is for all of you, please, if you have a question that's, that's on the tip of your tongue that you would like to ask Grace, please put it in the chat function any time during the, um, the 20 minutes that Grace and I are having a chat. And then we'll save about 15 minutes and I'll have a quick scan uh, and hopefully your real names are in, on your screen and I'll call you out to ask your question for Grace. We may not get all of them done, but Grace, if you're comfortable, we may send a few to you later on and we can, we can keep going offline if that, suits, if that suits yourself. Is everyone okay with that? All right. Now, please, I'm going to count to five. Could everyone who is on mute please turn off mute? Can we hear you? We want to hear you. Hi, Tracy. Hello, good. Someone hey say, say hi, Grace, not me. You don't need to say hi. <laughs> hi, Grace. Hi. <laughs> okay. I just want to, on behalf of all of the club, Grace, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And let's all give Grace a three cheers for, um, for being such a wonderful ambassador for cycling, member of the club, and her, her latest achievements. <laughs> That was we're gonna do it again. <laughs> oh, that, that was great. <laughs> Love all it. Right, so you know all how that sounded. Can we remember <laughs> that and we'll have another go at the other end? <laughs> okay. um, I'm just gonna you for a moment, if that's okay. And just share, um, the first time we met was when you won the Continental the Oceania Championship and I was the president of Oceania Cycling Confederation. So guess what? In 20 years' time, you can end up in the pop, on the political side of the sport as well. Um, right. <laughs> but Grace only started cycling in 2015 after being involved in running. 
And as we look at the international peloton, particularly the women's peloton, a lot of women come into sport, into cycling from different trajectories. Um, you know, not always being a junior, always through the system. Um, so you started racing domestically with Holden, which is fantastic. And then you joined a British team run by an Australian, Rochelle Gilmore, yeah. with all high top. Doesn't it go to show how strong Aussies are in all parts of the sport and in particular women? So from 2005 to 2015, that's a pretty quick trajectory from domestic racing. You joined St Kilda Club, I think, as a recreational rider. Is that right? Um, maybe originally and then, yeah, I upgraded to a race licence. Or... Okay, so you got in somewhere and you got into the St Kilda Club. What a great, what a great place to start. Yeah. So from 2015 and everyone, that's only six years ago, to now... Um, went from local to national to domestic national teams, NRS teams to Wibble High Five, one of the best teams in the world at the time. Uh, and then um, another cause dear to my heart, Amy Gillett Foundation, of course, is a scholarship holder. And then you um, joined um, Mitchelton Scott um, after that. So that's a pretty quick trajectory. And let's just think about in that time when you uh, went to the international season, so the last four years, um, first in the Continental Championships, Oceana time trial, second in the road race, um, your first year at nationals, third in the road race, fourth in the time trial 2018. By 2019, you'd won the time trial at the national championships. So it sort of sets the scene pretty early. Um, 2020, and we'll talk about COVID, what happened last year and how everyone found a way and how you found a way mentally and physically. Um, second in the National Championships time trial and third in the road race before coronavirus was a real thing and impacting us all. And then last year against, you know, all of the global odds, the World Championships happened. Wasn't that wonderful just as a thing that happened in Amola, Italy? And Fifth. Can we talk about that later on in the yeah. time? <laughs> yeah. And then this year, um, your domestic season, a really strong season again, silver in the road race and time trial, the national championships. And then overseas, for those who followed the spring classics, the Tour of Flanders on the podium in the Tour of Flanders, congratulations. Thanks. And in La Course, which is another wonderful milestone for cycling, soon to become the Women's Tour de France next year. Uh, fifth in the course. Grace, that's just an amazing journey. We haven't even got to what happened a couple of weeks ago. So <laughs> pretty, yeah. fantastic, pretty fantastic. So why don't we just open up and just take a little step back. Can you just let us know where you are right now and what you're doing? It's, it's still the Olympic Games and you were only in Tokyo just over a week ago. Yeah, so I'm back um, in my base in Italy in a small town called Gavarate in the Varese region. So it's quite close to um, Lake Como and Lake Maggiore. Um, and yeah, I came back from Tokyo and I took a little bit of a break. I went to Switzerland to visit a friend and to try and have a bit of a circuit breaker to um, ward off the post games come down. <laughs> so yeah, now, now I'm just starting back training. Um, yeah. So what does a break look like? Yeah, I took, I think I've taken more time off than most people coming back from the games. I took a week and a half. Um, I actually had a shoulder injury uh, throughout the game. So I've, um, yeah, I need a bit of extra time to recover from that because I've put some extra stress um, on that injury racing. So yeah, I, I need time to heal and, um, mm. and then reset. Yeah. We're going to talk a bit about the rest of the season in just a moment, what's coming up, and a little bit about what happens after that, that come down, as you say, whether, whether we win, lose, draw, or somewhere in between, when, you know, for all of us who know, whether it be, you know, work or sport and personal lives, when you're building up towards something very momentous, no matter what there is, there's, a, there's the other side, isn't there? And we're all dealing with the other side in, in our everyday lives, let alone being on a world stage or an Olympic stage. So I'm just going to hold that for a moment because that's quite a poignant um, piece to talk to. Yeah. Um, 
so this year and last year, you know what's been happening in Australia and around the world, and it's almost like the cycling peloton has dodged lots of bullets in terms of coronavirus and sometimes been impacted, other times not been. Um, you've been racing and trying to race and, and finding a way um, for the last two full seasons now, um, literally you know, on the eve of the international season last year. Tell us what that's been like for you as an Aussie um, and also with the team. Uh, and the broader at uh, the broader peloton the last couple of seasons yeah it's been really tough I think um yeah particularly for me the hardest bit is being um so separated from Australia I mean in a normal season it's it's far away but um for the past two seasons it's yeah been literally impossible to even consider coming back to Australia mid-season and I find that really tough <laughs> because my um my husband's in Australia so um yeah that, that's hard for me and stressful as well not knowing you know the situation with getting back into Australia um and and the rules changing uh, constantly on that front um, but of course, you know, there's there's definitely people um, in harder situations than than I am that are trying to get back to Australia. So, yeah, yeah, you sort of have to put it all into perspective. Um, and then on on the racing side of things, with you know, so many races being in doubt um, and cancelled last minute or yeah, you're, you're not quite sure what you're going to be doing next week. <laughs> so I think I've handled that sort of uncertainty quite well. Um, uh, I'm usually just focused on, you know, being, taking the next step well, um, rather than getting too far ahead of myself uh, with big plans for the year. So um that's allowed me to be fairly adaptable and make the most out of whatever is happening in the current moment. <laughs> so, and that, that, that's a lot, you know, particularly when you haven't got all of your, um, all of your foundations and all of your, your handle on all of the support structures that are normally around um, us in our domestic environment. So tell me, how's the team, what, what role has the team played in helping um, keep an, you know, keeping you on solid ground and, and being stable mentally and physically so that you can focus on only the things that you can control? Yeah, well, the, the team takes a lot of the logistic stress away. Um, so, yeah, they organise all our um, COVID testing and flights and um, just all the protocols around keeping us safe in COVID and, um, yeah, well, you know, we're not wanting any extra resources or anything. So um, in the end, it's just our, ourselves that we have to look up, out for. Obviously, the team can't really do much um, in terms of the what Australia is doing or, um, yeah, the ease of getting in and out of Australia. That's sort of something that we just have to sit back and um, be part of but yeah uh, definitely taking all the the external stress um, away a little bit helps from the team side mm. so let's let's consider the transition from being part of a trade team to um, being part of an Olympic team uh, it's a very different world and there's different pressures and a, and a mindset so for you, um, Tokyo 2020 is actually Tokyo 2021. So let's postpone the whole thing by a year. Um, how, did, how did that work for you mentally and physically and in the way you calibrated uh, when you knew that there was a postponement? And did that, in effect, aid you? Um, or, you know, what was, what was going through your head over that period of time? Yeah, I think uh, initially I was disappointed and you know, having an, another year ahead to, like, we were just, you know, a few week, weeks away from um, the team being selected for Tokyo 2020 when the games got postponed or at, at that time we didn't know if they were being cancelled or postponed really. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was hard, but um, 
I wasn't, it didn't throw me off too much. Um, and then in the end, it actually served me quite well because, um, yeah, last year I was sort of, you know, met, I was a good chance for the team, but I wasn't definitely in the team. Whereas this time around, I was really confident that come selection, I'd be on the team. So, um, yeah, in, in the end, I was in a better position uh, to make the team and compete in Tokyo. So it worked out well. A good world's result does that for you. <laughs> pretty, pretty handy. Um, so let's just think about that Olympic selection. You know, uh, you know, most people don't um, don't ever have that as a thing in their mind or as a as a um, a realistic ambition that's in front of them. When did um, the Olympics become either a, a fantastical goal? Um, you know, could be as a child. And when did it become a real tangible goal in cycling for you? Yeah, I think since I was um, yeah primary school student I dreamt of being at the Olympics um especially yeah with the the Sydney 2000 Olympics um that was yeah quite an exciting event to watch and you know I've always been quite fascinated by athletes and what it takes to be at that top top level um so yeah I think I always dreamt of that and I I originally, I was um, a runner when I was younger. So um, my dreams of being an Olympian was sort of, I pictured being uh, on the athletics track, but <laughs> um, yeah, that, that journey didn't really work out for me. I was quite riddled with injuries running. Um, but then, yeah, I took up cycling, not really, not really expecting that it would be a path to the top level. But as, you know, I took each step of the journey and got really involved um, and competitive in racing and I just wanted to take, you know, keep taking it further. And then, yeah, I guess I don't know at what point I thought that the Olympics were actually a reality, probably not until last year. Um, yeah, it's sort of a dream that you 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 don't believe until you're there. Yeah, mm, and then you're there. Um, <laughs> someone someone may have a question about the selection process in hand. How do you handle how how that's handled? But we do. I'm sure everyone wants to listen. You know, to you about your stories and just um how the road race unfolded because we were all watching and those of us who know the know can know more a bit more than others. So you'll you'll have some more <laughs> insights for us. Um, but Tokyo, um, the road races are traditionally in the first weekend, which is fantastic, a great way to start. And then cycling continues throughout the whole of the Olympic Games. So just for everyone, um, cycling is the third biggest sport in the Olympics and we're really proud of that and, we, and it's getting bigger. Um, so the road race on the first weekend and the time trial in the middle of the first week, how long, did you, how long before the road race did you go into Tokyo and where were you based? Um, so we arrived um, seven days before the road race um, and we went straight into the cycling specific hotel, which is basically two hours out of Tokyo near um, Mount Fuji Speedway. So that was where the road race finished and the time trial uh, started and finished. So, um, yeah, we were quite a bit away from the athlete village. We were supposed to stay in the the village the night before the road race because it started in um in like close to central tokyo but uh in the end because of some uh covid cases um around the time that our team doctor decided that we should stay in a separate hotel so um we missed out on the village experience unfortunately but i think it was for the best just to be safe mm. Paris is only three years away. <laughs> so let's talk about the road race first, the first weekend. Um, before we get into the politics of the race and what happened inside the race envelope, because there's a lot that goes on inside that envelope, as you know. And um, how do you, you as an athlete, transition to racing as a nation in a team of four racing for your country? 
when only a few weeks ago uh, you were racing with your trade team, albeit one of your teammates on the Olympic team as well. But your new, your now teammates, you know, Tiff and Sarah Giganti were on trade teams uh, that you were racing against. How does how do you shift the mindset? And in a short period of time, how do you all come together as a team? Yeah, so we had um, since the team was selected, we had quite a lot of sort of Zoom meetings together, and um, I mean, we already know each other well as riders. Um, from racing together you see quite a bit about um, yeah how each of us races and what what we do in certain situations so um, we yeah and and the strengths and weaknesses of each person Um, but we did spend quite a lot of uh, time before coming together in Tokyo just um, bonding and talking virtually and going over um sort of our broad race strategy and um yeah so everyone was really familiar with what was expected of them and um I think we became a really really strong unit of four um entering into the race so even though we don't race together that often we were fairly confident um, with how we would be able to work as a team it's fantastic. And you've got one of the evergreens in, you know, Tiff Cromwell uh, and one of the protégés in Sarah Giganti. So it's quite an amazing spectrum when you think about the, the the breadth of experience there. So you talked about racing together as a team and, and um, what it's like in the World Tour. Um, let's just put it straight on the table. There are race radios. Um, yeah. On the decision-making table until a few months ago in the Olympic Games, there's no race radio. So, so tell us before we get into what happened in the race. Um, what is, what's it like how, in communicating without a race radio uh, and understanding the nuances that are going on inside a race? Yeah, it's pretty tricky because um, obviously, without a radio to communicate to each other, we need to be near each other. So, one of our main objectives um, racing was we had. Tiff is our team captain and she was our magnet. Um, oh, sorry, did, it, did I lose you for a bit? You're back. <laughs> do, do, the, do I need to repeat what I just said? or You talked about magnet and that's where we lost you a little bit. Yeah, so, so Tiff Cromwell was our magnet. So we, uh, yeah, the, we needed to find her in the peloton um, and ride near her. So that was um, our strategy for making sure that we were all up to date with information. And then, yeah, you you need to go back to the team car if there's something that we don't know and we need to clarify. Um, So it, yeah, it's definitely not as easy um, as when we have race radios in the world tour. Hmm. We could spend a whole hour talking about race radios and why they should and shouldn't be allowed in the world too. Maybe that's another conversation for a bunch, you know, a coffee shop ride when you're back home. Um, but the fact is that's part of the Olympic Games. Against the uh, Olympic gold medalist um, Anna Kaisenhofer uh, prior to the Olympic Games and how much did the Australian team know about her capabilities? Yeah, we... Uh, well, personally, I didn't know her at all, and I don't think anyone else on the team did. Um, so, yeah, she was a massive surprise. Um, I think, yeah, basic. She, she's not like a um, like amateur. She's been she's raced um, in the in UCI teams before, but basically decided that that wasn't for her and um, stopped doing that. So, yeah, I think, yeah, she, she definitely has strength um, on the world, world stage, but relatively unknown compared to the, the race favourites. So it was a bit of a surprise. 
Yeah, I'm going to leave that burning question for someone else to ask. So I'm waiting for questions to come into the chat box, everyone. But there's a question on, I'm sure, everybody's tip of their tongue, but I'll wait for, for everyone to ask that question. Now, there's lots of Annas in the peloton at the moment. Um, <laughs> Anna Kaysenhofer. We've, of course, got our very own Anna Wilson, uh, one of our legends in Australian cycling, um, Anna van der Bregen, Anna Meek van Vluten, um, and that brings us to the Dutch contingent. Um, mm. How much of the peloton was was watching and focusing on the Dutchies, and how did um, the Australian team uh, plan their race um, prior to and during and during the race relative to you know Anna down the road and what the Dutch were doing? Yeah, so uh, coming into the race, it was obvious that the Dutch uh, were the strongest team and the team to beat. Um, yeah, we. We sort of thought about what they were potentially going to do. Um, they had many cards to play, but knew that um, their weakness would be probably in a situation like what actually happened. Um, but unfortunately, we didn't think that that was going to be the move that stuck since it went straight from the gun. So we didn't put anyone in that which was a pity um but yeah basically the time went out and um everyone left were like well it's the dutch's responsibility to to control that um and it, yeah it got quite risky out to 10 minutes um and they were basically you know asking some of the other bigger teams to help them and it was only the Germans really that agreed um they asked us and we we said no uh, not until we were further into the race um and yeah sort of by that stage we weren't in a position to help anyway once mm. once it got to a really sticky point so um yeah, it all fell apart a little bit. <laughs> Very unexpected. Yeah, um, we could see that on the screen. And, you know, uh, there was conjecture around who knew and who didn't know who was up the road and how long. Um, did the Aussies know? Did you all know who was up the road and, and what that was looking like all the way through? Um, we weren't, we didn't know um, all the riders up the road and, and didn't expect them to be as strong as they were. We, there were... Some other riders that we're a bit more familiar with um, that thought could last a while but yeah definitely um, Anna was completely uh, beyond our expectations so um, yep. <laughs> and, and then the race is run and won and uh, you know circumstances are quite bizarre but they are what they are and, and you know we've seen strange things that was a pretty strange one um uh, and then as you mentioned uh went out a long way and that's a long way uh and you know at that time so there's a bit of reconciliation on the other side of the road race and then a few days later you've got to back up yeah so personally i i had a really bad road race um far below what i was expecting of myself um I, yeah, I thought I would be there in the end, but um, unfortunately I had probably my worst day on the bike for the whole year, um, right when it counted. And I don't really, I don't really know why. Um, I suspect that it was the heat, even though I'd prepared um, for the weather, but yeah. Um, I, regardless, I had to reset and um, focus on the time trial, which was actually the event that I'd trained specifically for. Um, so that was a bit of a mental, uh, yeah, mental backflip that I had to do or forward flip to um, get in the right space to be confident in my ability again um, just a few days later. So, so that's where I, I don't actually ask any more questions because you had to get yourself in the right space and you had a few days and the right space was was pretty right um in your very first outing at olympic games uh you know to be so close and you know from fifth in the world championships last year to being in the in podium position to finishing fourth by only a couple of seconds 
Um, I've got no words. That's just extraordinary. And I'm sure everybody, you know, listening and watching was thinking the same thing. Um, over to you. How did you prepare? Um, did you change anything in, in what you were going to do on the day with what you learned from the road race? What was going on during it? And just share with us what that felt like uh, when the result was, was known. Yeah, so I, I didn't change anything based on the road race. I, um, yeah, put complete trust in, in the preparation and the plan that I had. So, um, yeah, I, I'd used um, in the lead up, we have a really great tool of full gas where we can ride um, the course virtually. So I'd done a lot of work on that and was, quite confident in my pacing of the course and what I needed to do in each section. Um, so yeah, basically when you, when I get to the start of a time trial, it's just pressing play. Um, unfortunately, uh, I had planned to pace on power a little bit. I don't, I don't focus too much on it, but just to get a bit of a guide and, uh, my power meter disconnected on the, on the start ramp. So I rolled off and I was like, oh, no power. So, um, yeah, I had, I had practised without, um, without that for pacing. So I had a fair idea of what I needed to do, but still um, I probably went a little bit too hard in the first half um, and paid for it in the last 5Ks. But regardless of that, I, I think that I, yeah, put everything I could out on the course and, um, yeah, I was really happy with my race and, and not disappointed coming forth. Um, yeah, I, yeah, in the end, the, the outcome is what it is um, and I was happy with the process that I put in and, and, yeah, there's a lot more to come, so it's exciting. Well, that's the thing that we want to hear. We're so extraordinarily proud of you. We knew you were up for a good race. Um, mentally, that's a thing, how you deal with that. Now that I know that your power uh, decided not to play its role on the day, that's another mental switch, isn't it, on how you then recalibrate what you're going to focus on. Uh, that yeah. just makes it even more extraordinary, uh, the heat, the humidity, the disappointment and that and the recalibration. But, yes, Paris is three years away, so not far. And it's not five years from the last <laughs> Olympic Games. Yeah, um, yeah. Grace, there's some questions that are coming. I could ask you a lot more, of course, but I do want to th um, throw open to the floor. So if you have a question in the chat box, please turn your um, your mute off so that we can hear you. Um, first question, one of them questions already been answered. Um, you knew who was up the road. Um, Lisa, you've got a you've got a question for Grace. I do. I guess it's a bit um, kind of maybe it's a question that should be asked last because it's not about the Olympics. But I'm just curious to know um, what your next target race is or what your next event, what you're targeting. Yeah, so my next big target is the World Championships um, in September. Mm -hmm. they're, they're in uh, the Flanders region of Belgium. So um, I sort of have to make my mind up a little uh, because there's uh the time trial is um completely dead flat and the road race is like a classic style race so they have quite different demands um so i need to prioritize one but i'm excited for both of them and um mm -hmm. yeah that's my next big target and uh we'll, yeah i mean i'll do all i can to manage the demands of both in training but in the end you need to focus on on one as the priority um uh but leading into that i have uh the uh, holland ladies tour um that's in two weeks so that's sort of a bit of a build event for me um and yeah it, it, i i will still be uh retraining so i don't have um a huge target for that race but then straight after the world championships we have Paris roubaix um mm -hmm. which is so the first women's Paris Bay is going, going to be quite exciting um, and lots of unknowns, <laughs> a little bit scary, but um, yeah, um, I'm keen for that one. 
uh, and I'll finish on the Women's Tour of Britain before coming home. So it's a bit exciting back end of the season. Um, Paris Roubaix has tried and tried a few times and keeps getting mm. and <laughs> our fingers crossed, some more than others. Um, how do you rate yourself on cobbles? Yeah, um, oh, cobbles are good for me. I I always enjoy riding the cobbles. So, um, yeah, the, the difference with Roubaix is that they're so much rougher than any of the cobbles in, in Flanders. So they become painful. Um, yeah. <laughs> Whereas, it's like, you can have the technique of riding cobbles, but regardless, you're just going to be in a world of pain. Um, by probably halfway through uh, the Roubaix. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. And it's going to be, I think, just a race to the first cobbled sector and whoever survives that will be in with a chance to win. <laughs> um, we can't wait to hear from you what it feels like and what it felt like on the other side of doing one and a half laps of the Roubaix velodrome. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, for yeah. all you may not be aware, and you may not be aware, Grace, but... There was a women's tour de France up until the late 1990s. And uh, we actually yeah. had one of our stages finish on Roubaix uh, with the back half of the circuit on the course of Paris Roubaix. So, oh, wow. Those later on. Awesome. And, and some blisters and a few other bits and pieces that um, do come out worse for wear. So, <laughs> yes. uh, good fun. Now, we've got a couple of other questions. One going a little bit back, Campbell. You've got a question going back to the road race. I was just taking the piss a little bit. I was just asking whether the, whether the Dutch can count to five, you know, five riders break, five, you've got to bring five back in. Um, it was just <laughs> astounding to watch the road race and see um, that the entire audience knew that there was, uh, that Anna was up the road, but uh, the peloton didn't seem to know, uh, know that she was there. And were there no signs pointing out the gaps or uh, there's a lot of debate about how much information was coming back to the, uh, um, to the riders? Yeah, it can be very confusing um, in the peloton. Um, we, we do get like a moto come back with numbers and time gaps. Um, but yeah, often if you don't know someone's number, you don't know who it is. Um, you need to clarify that with your team vehicle. And then, yeah, it can be you may be able to count to five, but um, sometimes you don't, you won't see when the peloton catches a person. So um, yeah, it, it's quite easy to not know um, that there's someone ahead of the race, and and you you watch the behaviour of other people in the peloton, and if they're riding like there's no one out the front, then you assume that. So. Um, I completely understand how they didn't know she was she was ahead. So, um, yeah. So, do you think do you think that's an argument to have race radios in the Olympics, or do you think it's actually an argument for um, more gritty racing by getting rid of radios um, across the professional across professional racing altogether? I don't um, think it's kind of a weird um, yeah. weird to have it in some and not in the others. Yeah, I think it needs to be consistent. And, um, or, yeah, personally, I would argue for, for radios in the championship events as well um, because, yeah, otherwise we're relying on the race organisation to bring information to us. Um, and, yeah, also, you know, if, if you're on a in, in the Olympics or in the world champs, there's quite often countries with very um, small teams and they don't have the luxury of going back to the car. They don't have anyone to talk to. So um, I think it's even more unfair to them not having any communication. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a heavily debated topic, I guess. <laughs> It's been heavily debated for decades and this will bring forward the debate yet again uh, because of what happened and what transpired. And I'm sure we all understand there's, there's, um, there is a method and uh, rationale both ways. One's about the, the rider being thinking for themselves versus being coached, excuse me, from the team car. 
Um, the other one's about safety and the other one's about um, shared knowledge of key elements about the bike race. So uh, we might do that as a coffee shop ride when, when you know you can come <laughs> home, perhaps uh, we can we yeah. down the road. Um, a couple of other questions. I'm going to um, throw over to yourself, Des. You've got a, a really um, good question around um, Grace's trajectory over the last couple of years. Hi, Grace. Um, yeah, it's been great to watch your progression over the last couple of years. So I was just interested is is that just the culmination of years of you know the same work and that's finally you know come to fruition or do, do you do something different over the past 18 months as to how you approach your training or your attitude to racing or your your position within your team is what what led you to that point of all of a sudden being in the mix yeah, um, I think it's a, a whole lot of different factors. Like there's not one thing that I did that um, brought me up to that level. But, um, yeah, I think my ability's always been there, like my strength on the bike. But um, coming in late to the sport, it took me a bit of time to develop the other racing skills. So, positioning in the peloton um yeah just more technical skills and actually being in the right place at the right time um and learning to read races so um yeah now i'm very aware of when the key points in a race are that you really need to like make that extra little bit of effort um when you know it's about to split um, and that puts me in, in the position to uh, race for, for the win. So I think that's one of been, been one of the major things is just, um, yeah, knowing when to put in the effort and, um, yeah, technically having the skills to do that as well. So. And mm. um, I'm going to throw open, to, there's another question coming up um, around fast forwarding to the next Olympic Games. Um, and we're going to hold that for the end because uh, there's a lot of great things happening with Paris, as you know. Um, so, Matthew, you want to, um, you're want to? you going back over um, Grace's Pelmares, particularly in 2020. Um, what's your question, please, around Liège? Oh, hi, Grace. Um, really enjoyed uh, watching the uh, time trial. Fantastic effort. Awesome Thanks. effort, really. <laughs> Sensational backup. Outstanding. Um, yeah, look, I was listening to the Stanley Street podcast you did a while ago <clears throat> and you were disappointed in um, as a team bike exchange and select you to ride Liege Baston Liege this year. So hopefully you get a go next year. Have a red hot go. Yeah. Will you get a race <laughs> yeah. selection? Um, yeah, hopefully. I think um, I really love that race. So, um, yeah, as you heard, I was disappointed not to do it uh, this year. So, um, yeah, after after that was sort of my breakthrough race last year, coming second there. So, um, yeah, I, I want, want to be there again. Um, yeah, regardless of whether I can be on the podium again, it's just an awesome race. It was just one of the most exciting attacks I've ever seen in a road race, I reckon, up that last <laughs> climb and almost catching. Um, I can't remember who won it, but why you were so close. Uh, yeah, Lizzie Dynan. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, awesome. It's sort of one of those out-of-body experiences that I yeah. <laughs> well, I can't believe I did that. But <laughs> <laughs> No, well, outstanding. Let's hope you have an out-of-body experience in Belgium in uh, around about six weeks' time because that's the sort of that's the sort of lumpiness of the course of the road race. And uh, you know, just think about that disappointment this year of not racing Liège and, and have another go this year in, in the worlds. Good opportunity for you. We've got time for one more question and gonna just gonna focus a little bit on gender equality. And um, as you've seen, there's been a rise in different events coming into the Olympic Games. And Kath, I'm gonna throw to you in a moment if you could turn your microphone on. Um, as you know, Paris will have for the first time in the road race, equal men and women's fields, which has been uh, a decades long effort. And it's wonderful that it's going to take place. Uh, and uh, there are many, many, many hands that had a role to play in there. Um, so let's think about 
your opportunity. But Kath, you had a bit, another bigger question around the type of events in the Olympic Games. Yes, I was fascinated to watch the road race, which is obviously, it's a team event, but an individual wins the medals. And then we've been watching all last week, a whole week of track where there's just 50 different events running all week and they're racing over and over. I'm wondering about your opinion about what you think about the potential for more road races. So to have, say, an individual road race and a team road race and an individual crit and a team time trial and maybe even a mixed gender race where you have to have two men, two women, um, those sorts of events. Is there, you know, any thoughts from the pro peloton about those sorts of events? Uh, I think, um, I mean, it would be a bit weird to do an event that we, we don't um, race generally in the year um but a team time trial would be really cool um that's that's an awesome event and a great um great thing to share um with your team um the world championships have trialed doing these mixed relay events with you have two men and two women um and I think that's been quite interesting and maybe it's it's an option for um, the Olympics as well. Seeing they did, you know, they did that in the athletics um, mm -hmm. with the mixed relays and that was quite exciting. Um, and I think they did it in swimming as well. So, yeah, definitely mm -hmm. something that could be considered for uh, road racing as well. Or even just have the road race as a team race because you could obviously see the Dutch were riding it as a, you know, a team race but one only gets the medal. Oh, you know, yeah. if Australia had won, I would have loved to have seen you all up there on the podium all getting a medal because you all put in the effort. Yeah, definitely. I think there needs to be more. Um, I mean, as, as riders, we always recognise yeah. um, that it's a team effort and that we, you know, you share that medal. But, um, yeah, externally, like, the attention goes on one person. So, yeah, it, it would be nice to share that. Yeah. Oh, and can we sign you up for the club championships for next year? Maybe you and Matilda and Neve want to join the club team. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that, that's a, on a, a very good note. That was a really good segue. Grace, we're running out of time. It's um, Sunday night here, but more importantly, you've got a day to enjoy before you get back into really heavy training for your racing coming up. Um, when do you think you might be coming back to Australia, all things being okay to come back in? Uh, so that's first question. And two, in your off season, what does a coffee shop ride look like for you? Can we keep up? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, I have a flight on the 11th of October, but um, yeah, we'll see. Hopefully that doesn't get cancelled or anything because um, yeah, it's very tight um, with flights back into Australia at the moment. I don't think there's anything available for the next couple of months. So um that would be quite devastating if I don't get that flight um and then yeah assuming I get back to Australia my um my off season is usually fairly I don't I don't take um I don't push it at all so um I lose quite a bit of fitness and then I'm very slow in in my first couple of weeks of training so definitely anyone will be able to keep up <laughs> well we we'll might hold you to that and you might may or might not be aware but St Kilda Club have been or has been trying several times to organize a women's weekend uh, for all the women club riders and uh, it was cancelled it was next weekend due some 50 women going out to um, Massenden area freezing cold winter that's how dedicated we oh all are gosh. Um, <laughs> But it just goes to show how popular cycling is and how important the club is to getting people engaged. So um, we'd love to invite you out to, to take that same group of women for a ride. Uh, and they'll all probably have a go at seeing how they, they won the sprint. And if you can just let one or two <laughs> try as hard as you can, we can still bet you would be great fun. <laughs> no, that sounds great. I'd love to join. So Grace, any closing words from you? Anything that you wanted to share with us that you've missed? Um, and I'm sure there'll be time when you get back if there are other things that come to mind. Uh, no, nothing comes um, front of mind, but um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to the St Kilda Cycling Club because um, it's been a great community and really um, 
fueled my love for cycling in the beginning and um yeah have stuck by me and been proud of me um each step of the way so uh it's really nice to be part of um such a strong community uh, it certainly is and I feel just as privileged as you and we've got so many Olympians as part of this club that's only just over 20 years old uh, and with the Paralympics coming up only in a couple of weeks time could everyone just turn off turn on their microphones uh, and have another reprise at that cheer that we did before um, I just also want to take note Grace you're right it's about the club wrapping its arms around everybody you know whether someone's coming in in their 50s and not ridden before or someone's just moved to Melbourne or transitioning from another sport it does go to show doesn't it that this is a sport for everybody um, and you didn't come in from a traditional cycling pathway and what's happened my background wasn't cycling either uh, and we're, you know, a focus on getting young kids in and young people, women and men alike. It is a great club. I also just wanted to take a note to thank um, Campbell and Alison for making tonight happen because without reaching out to you, we wouldn't hear from you. Um, so it takes that ability to have a relationship with people no matter who we are, who we come from and what heights we achieve. So thanks, Campbell, and thanks very much, Alison. Now, everyone, have you got your microphones on, please? I can still see a few mute. We're just going to try again, Grace, <laughs> and you can tell us how it sounds. Could we all please give a big three cheers to Grace for joining us and for such a wonderful season and more to come. Hip, hip. Hooray. 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 <laughs> that reflected how, how proud we are of you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining and uh, all the best for the rest of the season and see you back here before too long. Thank thanks, Tracy, and Thank thanks you. everyone for coming. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Grace. Thank you. <laughs>